We're going to continue to worship this morning. I want to take a moment and uh, just read a, a passage of Scripture uh, that is part of this particular series that we are wrapping up this morning. Uh, this passage of Scripture uh, comes to us this morning from the book of First John. And uh, uh, let me just get there. First John chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 16. And this is what the Apostle John wrote uh, in this book. He said, this is how we know what love is. Uh, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And if anyone has material possession and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. God's word is true, and it's meant to be lived. This morning, we're going to continue. We're going to actually finish up a series that we began earlier uh, this uh, month, uh, the month of October. And um, you will find in the pew in front of you. You'll find some note cards. I want to invite you to grab one of those note cards and uh, you take notes. If there's something that's shared today uh, that really, uh, you know, you want to think about a little bit more and impacts you, I want to invite you to um, just write that down, meditate that, maybe put it on your fridge or something like that, and just think about that a little bit more this week. Um, Yes. Well, here's the deal. You've, some of you reacted to that because I think you've heard that, that bit before, right? That bit of music. It's from the Twilight Zone, right? Twilight Zone. And um, did you know that from 1959 to 1964, there was a groundbreaking television program on, on CBS. The man who created the series, how many of you knew that Rod... Uh, Serling was a World War II paratrooper. Did you know that? He was actually a paratrooper and served in World War II. And as has been written about him in a book uh, that my kids gave me a few Christmas ago that I keep behind my desk, uh, the book's called The Dimensions of the Twilight Zone. And this is what they write in the book about Rod Serling. They said, Rod Serling's creation opened our eyes and expanded our minds beyond the boundaries of our own imaginations to dimensions of limitless possibilities. And uh, my family will attest that I have a rather over-the-top affinity for the program. If I can find any of the 156 episodes on TV somewhere, I will watch it. If there's a Twilight Zone marathon, I will watch it. I have recently found an entire app on TV that only runs Twilight Zone episodes. I will watch it. Yes. I've come, the conclu I've come to the conclusion, though, that one of the main reasons I'm drawn to the program is simply this. That show tells all sorts of various stories about our condition, the human condition. And as has been said about the Twilight Zone, it's about ordinary people in ordinary situations that often concludes with surreal and extraordinary outcomes. And because of Jesus' mission, values, and vision. We're going to seek to follow his example here at Ferndale. We're going to talk about outcomes. We've talked about all of these things over the last number of weeks, but today, what does it really mean? What, what does the outcome look like when we live these things out? Well, we think there are at least five things that we need to be thinking about. Number one is, how am I living my life differently? 
because of the Bible? How am I actively listening for the Spirit? How am I demonstrating compassion to those on the margins? How am I cultivating friendships with those within our church? And how am I joining Jesus on mission where I live, where I work, where I learn, where I play. This morning, I'm going to wrap up this series regarding our becoming a church of the dandelion effect. Our invitation is for you to consider. I tried to do my best Rod Serling at this point, but I don't really have it. Our invitation is for you to consider prioritizing our mission prioritizing our vision, our values that we've examined over the last few weeks. I want to, as Rod Serling would say, encourage you to travel to another dimension this morning, to step into what I call the twilight zone of this dandelion effect, a place of God's limitless possibilities and what we believe must be our outcomes. Here's the first thing. The first thing is we want to ask, how am I living my life differently because of the Bible? So it's one thing to say I'm going to live my life differently. What does that look like? What does it look like to live your life differently because of what the Bible teaches? Well, there are some examples that come to us straight from Scripture, from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 where the writer says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And then over in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus himself said in the verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, even more specifically, this expected outcome of living differently involves both what we believe and then how we live it out. Living in a way that our continuing spiritual growth, it's evident, people can see it. And folks, spiritual growth is not just what you know in your head, but it's exposed in your everyday life. And lest I give you kind of a misguided idea about spiritual growth, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you with this thought from a man that I admired for so many years when I was a youth pastor. His name was Mike Iaconelli. Mike Iaconelli said this. He said, spirituality or spiritual growth, it's not a formula. It's not a test. It's a relationship. Spirituality is not about competency. It's about intimacy. Spirituality is not about perfection. It's about connection. And this, this, Mike Iaconelli says this. He said, spirituality is not about being fixed. It's about being, it's about God's being present in the mess of our unfixedness. God's word, the Bible. Uh, we, we believe that it will transform us here at FFMC. Second, Here's the, other, here's the next outcome that we want to think about as we live out this, these values, this vision, this mission. How am I actively listening for the Spirit? What does that look like? Again, I think a perfect place, the best place to begin is to take a look at what Scripture tells us. And from 1 Thessalonians, we read these words. Rejoice always. This is, this is what it means to actively listen to the Spirit. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then the psalmist writes in Psalm 46, verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We want to be a people who take seriously this classic definition of, of Christian prayer. And that comes to us from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. This is what they wrote. They said, Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. 
And there's this, this visual that I appreciate as we consider this particular outcome to be active listeners to the Spirit. It's actually a visual of a hinge. Have you seen a door hinge like that goes on the, on the back of a door or, or, or uh, you know, on, on a cabinet that opens and closes? Well, Jim Cimbala, who's the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, he, he talks about what, what hinders listening to the Spirit or hearing from God. Jim Cimbala says this, in the spiritual realm, there is something that when absent shuts down the gracious operation of the Holy Spirit and wastes great potential of both the individual believer and the local congregation. Even though people may be in relationship with the Lord, the Bible gives us disastrous scenarios that occur when things become spiritually unhinged. From defeat to victory, something that we see over and over again in the Old Testament and the Bible, from slavery to dominion, it is all hinged on the simple act of sincere confession of sin. So you want to listen to the Spirit? One of the ways to be listening to the Spirit is to always be open, to be ready to confess. If there's something that's not right between you and God, right between you and someone else, don't let that hinge become rusted or, or broken. The emotional, the outcome, this outcome hinges on being a people of prayer and continual, constant communication with the Lord and always ready to confess maybe where we've fallen short of what God's called us to do and to be, a people who actively listen to the Spirit. Here's a third thing. Here's a third thing that we want as an outcome of living these things out. We need to be able to ask ourselves, how am I demonstrating compassion to those on the margins? And what does that look like? Again, Scripture is very clear about this. Everywhere you will find what God's call to us is regarding people who will live on the margins. In the, in the Old Testament from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, we read these words, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. And then in Romans chapter 15, Paul writes these words beginning in verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear the falling, the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. And then in 1 Timothy 5 chapter 8, again, Paul writes, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. There's a theologian by the name of Orlando Espen, and he reminds us of this. He said, welcoming the stranger, or as we would say today, the immigrant, is the most often repeated commandment in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, with the exception of the imperative to worship the one and only God. And the love of neighbor, especially those who are vulnerable, is doubtlessly the New Testament's consistent and constant command. Whether the cause, whatever the cause of immigration today, there can be no doubt as to where the church must stand when it comes to defending the immigrant. And while we're talking about this idea of demonstrating compassion to others, folks who are perhaps on the margins. I think it's critically important to share one of my key convictions regarding this particular outcome. Friends, I believe it's a mistake to primarily serve other people in order to get noticed. Do you know what I mean by that? Do you know what I mean? I want us I want to call us to serve primarily with the idea of building relationships, of having a genuine interest in others and their well-being. That is where we start. If we're serving others with some sort of hidden agenda where we announce who we are and what we believe, wearing hats and T-shirts, and we're going to shoot people with our gospel gun, we forget that the compassion we are talking about here it begins with meeting basic needs creating positive relationships. And in light of that outcome here, 
at FFMC, a good question that we should continually be asking ourselves is, what are my motives? Why am I doing this? Do I really want to see our community and those who are part of it? Do I want to see them blessed? Do I want to see them flourish through my efforts to demonstrate authentic compassion, to truly just see them? That's a demanding outcome that we're talking about here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. It's not easy. But being a people of relationship, it demands it. Here's a fourth outcome. Speaking of relationships, how am I cultivating relationships with those in our church? And what does it look like? Well, this morning from 1 John, this is how we know what love is, Jesus says, but Paul writes. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. If anyone's material possession sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God actually be in them? Dear children, let us not love one another with words or deeds, but with actions and in truth. Years ago, I came across a fascinating story. I just want to share that with you, if I could. It comes from this book called The Safest Place on Earth. It's a book written by Larry Crabb. And this is what he shares in the opening segment of the book. He talks about his wife, Rachel, and he. He says, Rachel and I were touring Miami Beach. We'd recently moved to South Florida from the gray Midwest and we're enjoying our first chance to visit the famed Sunshine Vacation Paradise. One block west of the luxury beach hotels was a very ordinary big city street, noisy, dirty, heavily trafficked with cabs and buses and plumbing repair trucks. The streets were lined with less than elegant businesses, and shops, and road dwellings with the occasional green shrub poking its way out of a square foot of dirt in the concrete. He says, no one was snapping pictures to send home or putting scrapbooks. At one point, we walked in front of a wood slatted porch, maybe 10 feet deep, with perhaps 60 feet of sidewalk frontage. At least 100 chairs were arranged in neat rows and columns, none touching, each in the exact same position to the others. The occupied chairs, and most of them were, each held one motionless retired man or woman staring straight ahead at the street. Dr. Crabb says, I can't recall seeing anyone rocking, though I'm sure someone was. I do remember that no heads turned to follow a passing taxi or pedestrian or to chat with another porch sitter. I didn't see any crossed legs. I remember one woman's stockings were bunched around her ankles. There were no paperback novels, newspapers, not even a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea. There was no conversation, no evidence of any of these people having been created by a relational God to enjoy intimate relating. The people's souls were asleep, numbed, I suppose, by years of lifeless relationships, pointless conversations. No doubt these conversations had all seemed important at the time, business deals, romantic encounters, child scoldings, religious meetings, but maybe such encounters with other people never touched anything deep enough in their life. Dr. Crabb concludes by saying this. I remember thinking, all their lives, everyone on this porch worked hard in Detroit or New York with the dream of retiring in Florida. And now they've made it. But look at them. Everything they live for has come to this. Lord, he says, deliver me from living in a manner that will leave me one day sitting in a chair next to other people who are also sitting in their chairs 
looking straight ahead, never into another person's eyes, never knowing anyone and known by no one. He said, the sight of that porch was unspeakably sad. And I never want to see that again. When we talk about cultivating relationships within our church, I sometimes wonder if out of all the outcomes we believe God wants us to make sure are part of who we are as a community leading into the future, I wonder if this particular outcome will be the most difficult. Vulnerability, the willingness to be honest about where the holes in our own souls are, is a demanding work that in many ways never, ever ceases. Here's the last encounter or outcome we want to encourage one another to be encountering. And it's this, how am I joining Jesus on mission where I live, work, learn, and play? What does it look like? Jesus replied with a story to this. Jesus said, a man prepared a great feast and he sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just brought a field and I have to inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just brought five pair of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they'd said. His master was furious. And said, go quickly into the streets, the alleys of town, and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. And so his master said, go out into the country lanes behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Friends, joining Jesus on mission. Here's something you need to know. I, f- I found this story, its origins. They've been traced back to a gentleman by the name of Herbert, Herbert Locker. He wrote this story. You may have heard this. He wrote it in a book called The Apostles of the Bible. And I want to share it because I think it puts in a proper context this particular outcome what we're talking about, this desire to be a a people who are joining Jesus on mission wherever we are. See, there's this imaginary account of Jesus' return to heaven after his ascension. As the angel Gabriel greets Jesus, he asks, Master, you died for the world, did you not? To which the Lord replies, yes. You must have suffered much, the angel says. And again, Jesus says, yes. Do they know that you died for them? Gabriel is now identified as the angel. Gabriel asked that question. Jesus, no. Well, only a few in Palestine know about it so far. Jesus says this in response to that, to that question from Gabriel, who then says, well, then what's your plan for telling the rest of the world? that you shed your blood for them. Jesus responds, well, I asked Peter and James and Andrew and a few others if they would make it the business of their lives to tell others. And then the ones that they tell could tell others and they in turn could tell still others. Finally, it would reach the farthest corner of the earth and all would know the thrill and the power of the gospel. But suppose Peter fails. And suppose after a while, John just doesn't tell anyone. And and what if James and Andrew are ashamed or afraid? Then what? Gabriel asked. I have no other plans. Jesus is said to have answered. I'm counting entirely on them. 
friends. This is up to us. We, jo we join Jesus on this mission. That's, that's what he's got. And I know that's a bit daunting. <laughs> I know it. I mean, to think, that, to think that we have a part that we play in fulfilling the mission of Jesus and that he is counting on us. Me, me, you. But here's the really good part. You know, because I know that's intimidating. Here's the not just good part. Here's the excellent part. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, 28 verse 20. I'll be with you as you do this. Day after day. Right up until the end of the age. These outcomes we believe will be the result of living according to Jesus' mission. Because of Jesus' mission, we're going to live on mission. Here at Ferndale, we're going, to, we're going to engage our communities by sharing God's transforming love. And because of Jesus' vision, we will live the vision here at Ferndale because just as the dandelion seeds are carried by the wind up to half a mile from where they're grown, whereupon they grow new dandelions and start the process all over, we will be a church of the dandelion effect. We will reach diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus. And we, we're called to reach those who live in Ferndale, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, our, our region, the world. They'll flourish and experience the transforming power of life in Jesus. We have values that will guide us. And the Bible will guide us. That prayer will position us. We, we believe relationships will strengthen us. We know that Jesus sends us. Grace motivates us. And remember, folks, remember, we're ordinary people in ordinary situations. But we believe we'll become a place filled. We'll become a place and a people filled by God's extraordinary possibilities. And we're going to look to answer these questions. How am I living my life differently because of the Bible? How am I actively listening for the Spirit? How am I demonstrating compassion to those in the margin? How am I cultivating friendships with those in our church? And how am I joining Jesus on mission? Where I live, where I work, where I learn where I play. You pray with me this morning. Now, God, is the challenge before us. How do we do this? How do we really live out these things? Lord, there are men and women, boys and girls, we don't know, but Lord, you love them. You want to see them become part of your forever family. God, we ask that you would give us everything that we need as you promise in your word that you will be with us day after day after day. You will not leave our side as we seek to live for you. And God, even as we look for opportunities to love one another more deeply, more passionately, Lord, may we become known as a people who love other people as we've loved one another, as we love you. We pray that these words would leap from the page, they would leap from these slides and through us they'd come to life. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>